And welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call. This is hour one of Patriot's Lament. In the next couple of hours, we are going to be expanding your horizons, talking about what it means truly to be free. What is liberty? And we're going to have uh, at least one special guest today on the show. I'm Steve Floyd, the man with the face made for radio, and this is not my show. <laughs> this, this show is the uh, the brainchild and is actually the, the work of the Bennett so Brothers. Uh, joining me in the studio today from Bighorn Enterprises, we've got Josh Bennett here with us. Good morning, Josh. Morning. Aaron, where are you? He I texted me yesterday. He said he would be here today. Yeah. Hoping so. Um, we were supposed to have a... Oh, hey, hey well, by the way, Aaron, if you are uh, listening, I do have my phone ready, so text me when you get here. We'll, we'll let you in. <laughs> we'll send some <laughs> spawn down to open the door. Um, we're supposed to have a special guest. He got mixed up with the times or something, whatever. He should be calling us here at the half hour. We're going to have uh, Jeffrey Tucker from Lazefer Books joining us. Isn't really he exciting. also the vice president of Mises Institute? I don't think he is any longer, but he was. He kind of was the one that got it kicked off, and uh, I think Mises.org, I was told that that's pretty much his brainchild. What he, it is what it is because of him today. And we know that everyone listening is going to Mises.org daily, Right. Or maybe not. No, at least they a couple should. times a week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I was uh, actually prepared for him to be here, but um, been thinking about this whole. I guess we might as well just go on a rant about something. No, oh, we could we could rant a little bit about what you talked about when you came in this morning with the the gas <laughs> project, if you'd like. Yeah. Oh, just there's not enough information to talk about it, is there? Well, well, I mean, the, you've had a couple guys on here that here's here's the talk. information. The governor has already put in the budget three hundred and fifty five million dollars. Mm. Uh, now I don't know where that money comes from. Certainly, I, I don't believe it grows on trees. Doesn't in Alaska? Uh, well, it, it does come out of the ground. Oh, the the oil money, <laughs> but it's money that could be going to our pockets. You know, they they rejected, by the way, once again another move to put money into the permanent fund mm. this week. So that they could spend more on projects like this. Well, they're. I mean, <coughs> read somewhere they're looking at a one point five billion dollar shortfall next year. Yeah, it's going to be. Uh, we're going to be deficit spending again, very shortly. And people seem to forget that we were deficit spending for years. Yeah. What fools? What a bunch of fools! I mean, this, <laughs> the state of any of them, should be financially secure, obviously, for the remainder of its existence, which unfortunately could be a long time. And well, a couple of weeks ago, I think we were talking how much they have raised the budget just in the last 10 years. It's over a couple billion dollars, isn't it? Well, exactly. And it's not about the politicians. It's about the, the principle behind it. Whenever you decide to go in and put your money into a pot that other people can put their hand into, even, right. if, even if you have some kind of a <clears throat> mechanism that says, well, you can only put your hand in the pot if X, Y, or Z, the very matter that, that you allow people to put their hand into the pot that other people are putting their money into, they don't have a choice, that, that's, there's a word for that, I believe. Uh, it ends with an ism, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> there's so many isms. But it, uh, generally, oh, it my doesn't end well with, for anybody because it takes away the personal responsibility it takes, and you know what? It is a lot easier, Josh, to spend somebody else's money than it is to spend my own. Well, that's all these people do. I mean, if you look at most of them, I don't think they've actually achieved anything in the private sector, have they? Uh, I mean, very yeah. few have actually the done ice, anything. The ice the park. That's. I mean, it's a that's private making a lot citizen. of money, right? Oh, as a private citizen, yeah. Well, in the last six years, the state of Alaska has ra- has stolen. Fifty billion dollars in the last six years, and they have managed to spend more than that. It's amazing. I mean, it's just so stupid. Because you know what they're going to do eventually? We're going to have to have an income tax. We listen to this uh, commercial that's on the station here, and it's some lady going, "Imagine if we didn't have the oil revenues, <laughs> we would have the highest taxes. Could you imagine what your life would be like? The highest income tax." But you know what? Guess what, folks? Bull crap, because we wouldn't live here. Go ahead. Try to bring on the highest income taxes out of all the states in the United States. We will move. I mean, all these, these uh, things where, you know, she's basically that thing is 
that commercial is set up to scare us to want to steal more from someone else. So it's trying to get the collective to get riled up, get the group, get the mob ready to steal more from someone else because if not, we're going to have to steal from you. Well, we have a choice in that matter. We can say, no, you may not steal from us, and we can pack up and move. So just try, politicians, to pass the largest state income tax in the United States, and we will all move. There's just no doubt in my mind. We would move. I would move. It's just, it's asinine. These people, that commercial drives me nuts. I mean, where they get, who is that lady? I hear her on lots of It's, it's part of the almost, almost million dollars that the city of Valdez is putting into trying to convince people not to go with the in-state gas line that would go from the North Slope through Fairbanks down to South Central. That's right, they the wanted to go to They wanted to go to Valdez. Valdez right. Because you know how Valdez gets their money, Josh, is they get it off of property taxes. Right. And that pipeline is big uh, property. property. That's right. <laughs> you know, Jeff T- Tucker, I was watching one of his videos the other day, and he was mentioning how at the uh, IRS building in, in Washington, D.C., above it, there's a big sign that says taxes are the price we pay for civilization. So I was thinking about that this morning. Israel brought that up to me. We were talking about it, laughing. So I thought, I should be one of the most civilized people in Fairbanks if taxes are the price we pay for civilization. And I pondered that for a minute, then realized, <laughs> no, that's not true. I'm living proof. <laughs> I, I mean, but you know what? If you think about it, though, all throughout history, whenever you think about civilized society, just that, just that very, that very phrase, civilized society. What do you think of? You think of the nobles. You think of the aristocrats. You think of people. Don't think of the state for some reason. You, you think of well. You think of the people who are living off the backs of the taxes. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're living off the taxes of the people. Oh. How did the aristocrats get their money? They steal. How did the kings get their money? They steal. How, how did how do presidents, Congress, how did they get their money? How, they steal. How, how do we fund? How how do the how did the Obama's vacations get funded? <laughs> uh, all, all of this yeah. high living is funded by, by going out and taking money away from people who work for it. I was, uh, I don't remember if I read it, heard it, or whatever, and someone was asking, well, why, why do we even have taxes anymore? Why can't they just print money? And Wow. We don't even understand. When they print money, they're stealing from us. Through inflation. All of it is designed to skin us alive slowly. You know, you don't, we've talked about it before, we don't, you don't kill your milk cows. You just get as much milk as you can, give them just enough grain to keep them producing, and milk the suckers. So that's what we have going on. This state, oh my word. You know, I moved here thinking I was coming up to the land of the free and home of the brave. And Alaska, literally, I thought, man, if there's any place in the United States left, it's got to be Alaska. They've got to be freedom-loving nuts up there. That's basically what people down there think. Oh, I was wrong. I got here and found out people are just as much statist, communist, socialistic jerks as anywhere else. It's unreal. Well, and that, that ties into a lot with what we're going to be speaking about with uh, mm. Jeffrey Tucker. Yeah. You know, because the, the Mises Institute is, is dedicated to this principle of showing statism to be what it is. Right. I was, well, another video, he was talking about um, civilization. And he said, so th- we're led to believe that civilization comes from the state. The state is the reason why we have civilization. So he said, well, let's go back. I don't remember what year it was. Let's, so we'll just make up a year, the year 1000 or whatever, or 800, or whatever year you want. And think of Europe, the great civilization that it is. And disease, pestilence, people couldn't feed themselves. People were, I was going to say warring, but we're not really civilized there, are we? They couldn't feed themselves. The average surf barely, I mean, it was horrible to be alive back then. Your life expectancy was zero. And what, 20, 30 years old, 40 if you're lucky? Infant mortality was unreal. Plague wiped out half or two thirds of all Europe, the, the Black Death. And so 
he asked, so are you meaning to tell me that if we had Department of Homeland Security, the TSA, Transportation Department, and Barack Obama, they would have been civilized for some reason, somehow, that that state would have made them better? Highly doubtful. We've got to get out of this mentality that the state is something that's anything other than de-civilization. It does nothing but destroy. It does nothing but steal. It cannot create anything. It doesn't create anything but destruction. It's us, people, engaging in free market, engaging in free exchange, not killing each other, and that's what makes civilization. But you know, Josh, there are so many people that are so conditioned to this idea that somehow they themselves are sheep, that they need a shepherd, mm. <laughs> that they need someone to tell them what to do, that they that they need someone to take care of them. They need to rule us in the proper exactly. way. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there are so many people that I know, good people, people that I love dearly, good friends of mine, who, and, and I don't know if it's a primarily a religious thing, because they look at scripture and Isaiah, you know, all we like sheep have gone astray, you know. <laughs> uh, they, they look at, uh, you know, Jesus is the good shepherd, and they, they make this implication that somehow in government, that somehow for the world around us that we all need, we just need to get a good shepherd in there, John. Yeah, I don't remember anything in there about Rome being the good shepherd. No, pretty sure not. Pretty sure. Yeah, I'm just going to have to throw that yeah, out there. Well, in, just, in fact, I won't even, even look it up. Just <laughs> <say>. <laughs> even even the the religious leaders of Jesus' time, you know, King or King Herod, or any of the other people that were in positions of power, Terrible. when Jesus came on the scene, he did not tell people to put their trust in government. Are you sure he wasn't born then so he could be under the state's protection? The state tried to kill him, John. Oh, that's right. In fact, the state did kill him eventually <laughs> in a different state. <laughs> wow. Uh, it's just, it's mind-numbing. I've been listening. I've tortured myself for the benefit of the listeners of this program to listen to Sean Hannity. And uh, he's been talking about this whole last week with the uh, Supreme Court talking about gay marriage. And this guy is an absolute nut job. He goes on and on about how, you know, we can't have gay marriage, and the state absolutely must regulate marriage. And he was playing clips of the different things uh, at the Supreme Court, and the people are going on about, you know, marriage is a constitutional fundamental right, and yada, yada. And he's saying, no, it's not. They're going to invent a right here because marriage is not a right you know it's you have to are you even listening to yourself Sean hello you <laughs> want the government to regulate it and so Christians are the worst ones of all they've given up their supposed right to marry and said no we'll let the state license us to marry as long as you keep these people out of the club don't let these people in, and then we will subject ourselves to your authority, your, actually their power, mm -hmm. to regulate our marriage. And these same people, who are the Christians, don't even think about the historical aspect of marriage licenses. It doesn't take much in, in terms of research. All i got to do is Google the history of marriage licenses. Right. When did they start? When... People didn't want <clears throat> blacks marrying whites in America. That's it. That's when it got, it got a lot of traction, too, in the 1930s, when there was a big push to make sure that the other undesirables didn't get married. Oh, yeah, you don't want that intermixing. Yeah, when it's not just the mixing of the... There, there's all those retarded people out there, Josh. I mean, that's the, that's the terminology they use. The uh, colonists. I don't remember what colony it was or which governor, one of those boneheads back then. You know, a, a king-appointed governor. Mm -hmm. He imposed a marriage tax at some point. Man, I'd, I always like to have a little more foundation when I'm talking because people are like, oh, yeah, I, yeah, prove it. Well, I can, but just not right the same. You're, so you're he imposed. You sound like Hank Bartos. I, I could prove it. I just don't have any of the information in front of me. Give me five minutes uh, and I'll look yeah. it up. <laughs> so he imposed a marriage tax on the colonists in his little colony. They 
found that to be undesirable to the point of mobbing and threatening to burn his house to the ground. And so he decided that no, there shall not be a marriage tax, which is a marriage license mm -hmm. is all it was. Uh, even with more historical context, people seem to forget that the person that we call St. Valentine, he was yes. a priest who violated the law by yeah. marrying people in the church when the state was not issuing marriage licenses. When the state decided, no, I'm, we're not going to let people get married, he said, you don't have a right to do that. These people want to get married in my church before God. I'm going to perform the service. You're going to do it. And he did it, and he was executed for it. Yep. Now, I'm not saying that, that homosexuals are going to be going to churches anytime soon to get married. No, but the point is, we should not be fighting over who the state sanctifies to be exactly. married. Exactly. You take that power away, that authority. Yeah, it's, it's just power. They don't have the authority. You take that power away, this whole issue is gone, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The state can't license people to be married, so it's over. And what is a license anyways? A license is something that gives you the right to do something that would be wrong otherwise. So when you go get a marriage license, you're saying that it would be wrong for you to marry, but now that I am licensed, it's just like it is wrong for you to hunt unless you, you're you, licensed. You're using the wrong words. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's an issue of right and wrong, and I think people understand that it's not an issue of right and wrong. <clears throat> it's permission. I do not have your permission to do this without your, your little permission slip. Right. But in theory, it is the permission to do that which is wrong. Because if you don't have it, it's wrong to do. It's only wrong because I didn't give you permission to do it. Right, but the state says if you make this, if you do this act, it is wrong. Now it's okay. Just like crossing the Chattanooga River. Mm -hmm. It is wrong because you will kill fish unless you have this little slip that you get down at the fishing game to cross it with a vehicle. They'll give you a little slip, and now you won't kill any fish. The magic piece of paper. That's awesome. I gotta go, I'll go get Aaron. Real All right. I, you know what I'd like to do is I'd like to get a little magic piece of paper that allows me to um, not get hit by cars when I'm running. It's just like a little magic protection that prevents a any harm from coming to me. <clears throat> Maybe I could get a little piece of paper that would make it so that I don't have to carry a gun anymore because nobody else's gun would work on me. And, and that if somebody produced a knife... The knife would not penetrate my skin because I've got a magic piece of, piece of paper. What other kind of magic piece of papers can we have, Josh? I mean, you think about that for just a minute. What does a piece of paper give you that you do not already have? It'd be nice if I could get a magic piece of paper that said the state won't bother me anymore. Ever. On any matter whatsoever. I'd probably pay for that one. Like 10 bucks. <laughs> I'd pay more than that. Oh, Let's, uh, let's take those calls All since right. we're going to be clearing the board here. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Who's this? Is it me? It might be you. What's your name? Oh, it's Carl. Carl, what's on your mind? Well, oh, I've been listening to some of our local stations this weekend. I think, you know, I know you guys are, like, not believing in government, but it does exist. And it, we should do what our... The founding fathers of the United States of America did and start passing around a petition stating our grievances as far as, like, we don't like uh, to be treated this way and that way and get everybody to sign it and give it to our representatives because what they're doing is, like, getting a perverted concept of the public opinion in a way where they... They, uh, you know, make they get a lot of these robo calls, right? And I think the problem, the problem with that though, Carl, is that our um, grievance is the state itself. So if we pass, sign a petition, pass it around, everything, and everyone signs a petition that says we wish you to disappear, they're probably not going to go for it. I mean, that's really our only grievance with the state is that it exists in the very first place. So if I can magically get up a petition, get everyone in the United States to sign it and pass it over, they still aren't going to well, leave. Who are you petitioning? You're petitioning the very one you're asking for <laughs> the authority or the power of the one that you want their authority or power to go away. 
Right. Somebody with the authority and power of a monopoly. Of authority you're not, you're and not power. You're not going to, right, with a monopoly of authority <laughs> and power, you're not going to petition them away. You, you really don't need the authority part at all. All you need is monopoly on force, just power. I think that we've realized... You we've, need a monopoly on law. Well, you showed, too, that the only real way to petition that away is to non-consent it to non-existence. Right. It it exists oh, with, the way, at the very oh, least. Yeah. <laughs> with the, at the very least, it has to have tacit support to exist. So your petition would just be withdrawing your consent. And the other part is you're actually bowing to the government, partic partic petitioning <laughs> it in the first place. No, we don't petition. We're not slaves. Please, please sir, these masses need to have a little more freedom. Oh, please give me something. You know, I, that. I was thinking about something the other day when I was driving up the hallway. You get lots of time to think think to yourself there. Uh, the idea of the divine right of kings, like kings have a uh, a birthright, a divine right to rule over us. Uh, somebody, anybody in America, actually most of the people in the free world since democracy freed everybody would see that as ludicrous i mean if if somebody stood up and said that they had the divine right to be our king we would laugh him laugh him out of the country if not beat him out of the country well anyone who took the time to read algernon sydney or jean Locke would understand that right oh so much too busy watching, but it, much too busy watching american <laughs> idol at one time the whole world believed in the divine right of kings. Even when we came to England, I mean, came to America, when the Americans were first uh, fighting the English, they were fighting for their rights as English subjects, as as subjects under the divine right of that king. Wasn't the Glorious Revolution, though, that was kind of based around the fact that they didn't believe in the divine right of kings? Now, hang on. Now you're bringing in Oliver Cromwell? Yeah. You see, now he, you, you got to love that story because here's this guy who starts things off on this idea of you don't have the right to do that and ends up saying, I have the right to do that. Yeah. And basically said to him, what did he call himself? Lord Protector? Protector. Lord Protector. Well, I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying. I think no, they didn't take away the starting. divine right of kings. They were fighting more of a religious war. The outcome of... Uh, it's so funny what the Protestant uprising ended up ultimately leading to state kings, where <laughs> kings before that didn't have um, the power to judge the law or to create law. And they after were still the fact, to the law. After the, after the Protestant uprisings, they obtained those powers. Right. Your point with the colonists, too, is good that they were actually fighting for their rights as British subjects, but their common law rights. And they also were fighting, saying that the king was not above the law. Even though they believed that he was their king the first year of the war, all of 1775, they were still fighting for their rights as British subjects. Right, and I get my point was is we, the only thing that changed was perception. There's no, there's basically no such thing as a king today because of perception. And 250 years ago, 300 years ago, you wouldn't even have questioned the divine right of a king to rule over you. And today we see that as just ludicrous because people withdrew their consent from that. There was no more tacit support, at the very least, of kings. Right, because they read Algernon, Sidney, and John. No, you see, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree with you on that, though, Aaron, because I've, all the people out there that are constantly asking for a good man. All we need is to get a good man in power. No, I, I understand that, but what I'm saying is, is that that kind of political structure is seen as laughable today. If somebody stood up and wanted to be our king, we would literally immediately call tyrant and laugh him off the stage and not be trusting of that and not think that any king has a, a right to rule over us so divinely. So aren't we kind of the same thing, though, because we see the mob as the divine? No, that's what I'm saying. I'm, oh. I'm saying that people... Beat your punchline up? I'm hoping that the age of uh, socialism is coming to an end, too. The the age of everybody prospers at at the end of, at the point of the gun is coming to an end. At people, the expense of others? Right. And the divine right of kings lasted a long time. I hope um, socialism didn't have as long as a, as long of a run as kings did. <laughs> but, no, uh, it's on its downhill slope. 
I think it's on its downhill slope because we don't have one person, one entity that everybody can look at that can steal, which is what makes socialism or <clears throat> democracy so bad. But it's also why it's not going to last as long, I think. Yeah, because the people that are, they've stolen so much at a rate that's unreal, never before seen in, in the history of the world. And we, we've talked about why with our wonderful Jedi Master, well, talking of our wonderful Jedi Master, Hans Hermann Hoppe. I'm going to have to go and uh, call a flag on that one, bringing in a premature Star Wars reference. <laughs> Penalty, 20 yards. I missed it. I was Take a timeout for Fox News. He is a Jedi. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Saturday morning wake-up call. It's technically hour one of Patriots Lament right here on PFAR. It's kind of... <laughs> right, I've been away for a while. Aaron Bennett has been uh, away What's working. Been here by Spirit. I was here. actually here only five minutes after, but you guys never let me in. Hey, I told you to text me, and I would have somebody to go down and I let you I text Josh. I figured it was just as oh, good. Oh, well, no. It's not. It's not. <laughs> anyway, speaking of the this, um, the transformation from divine right of kings to socialism, I was talking to a buddy of mine that I've known him for four or five years, and he's never really been good at anything. Hmm. Um, let me guess. No. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to name any names, but he, he um, and he wouldn't even be ashamed to admit that he's just really not good at anything. He can't really, you know, he wasn't going to go far, but he uh, finally got a state job. And now that he's had that state job for a little bit, he's making just a little bit over $100,000 a year. And he decided he was going to go get his CDL, and he didn't really want to pay for it, so he applied for state assistance. He's making $100,000 a year in the state. It's paying a $3,000 class for him to get his CDL. Without socialism, these kind of people, where would they be? Every dime that that person makes that I'm talking about is stolen money. Every penny of it. He's not worth that. He's not worth $100,000 a year. He doesn't do anything remotely productive enough to earn a hundred thousand dollars a year that is socialism even in the free market are you kidding me oh well i don't know there's jobs out there that free market would pay a hundred thousand dollars for it's just it's not sustainable how is it that um how much money do you make a year steve under 40 right and the taxes from your under 40 is paying for his hundred thousand dollars a year to, <laughs> to produce nothing. He doesn't produce anything. He maintains things that already are. He's not a producer. Why do we think that that's sustainable? You're making me want to go out and get a state job, Aaron. I'm making not. I'm starting to go crazy. If one more person complains to me that capital, if capitalists and corporate corporate America is, is what destroys America. I may just put a bullet in my head. I don't think I can take it anymore. <laughs> I'll do it for you. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Well, well Jeff Tucker, when he calls in, as he said, I just got a message here. He's going to be calling in the next couple of minutes. He's going to destroy that. Destroy what? That capitalism is the downfall. Oh, well, good. Well, let's take those calls then before he calls in. Four, Maybe. five, eight to talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Yes. Oh, we Sweet. cleared the lines. There we go. There's a balance between talking... Just enough to make people interested and in wanting to call in and then talking just enough more to make them want to hang up. <laughs> yeah, but they called in a little early, so I don't think we were – I don't think that we had rocked their minds yet. And while, while you're collecting your thoughts and, and, and waiting for uh, the call here from our guest, I, I need to know if the state is the problem when it comes to jobs, why is it that the only solution we ever hear about in the public – discourse is about creating more government jobs. Well, you have to have the state. The state has to justify its job every day. It's why we have newscasts. What do they show? Death, destruction, no jobs, blah, 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 blah. Then the state will create 30 million jobs or whatever that are state jobs. And then they tell us, look, the economy's going good. Look at what we're doing for you. And they leave out the part that they have to steal your money to get this employment up 
and it's all fake employment because they're not producing anything. They're parasitical and they're very. A lot of times they produce bads like law enforcement. No, it's always they produce bads. Oh. What do they produce that's a good? Nothing. You don't have states. Well, doesn't the state from just from its inception have to produce a bad to start doing its supposed goods? Well, yeah, it has to steal. Oh. Immediately oh. to fund itself to steal. <laughs> oh <more>. my hand. <laughs> And then, like uh, I was talking about, when right before you came in, and but and people don't even realize when they print money, they're stealing. Even when the, the very fact that they print a dollar bill, another dollar bill, another dollar bill, they're stealing from us. Right, every one, the, every extra one that they print is. Oh uh, snap! I believe uh -oh. we have them. Yeah, All right, let's do it. You guys are ready? You're excited? Let's yes. welcome our guest here to the program. Good morning. It's great to be here. I'm sorry that I'm late. It's oh. never happened before. <laughs> no problem. We have uh, today. We have Jeffrey Tucker as our special guest. She's the executive editor of Laissez Faire Books. He, I don't believe you are now, but you used to be vice president of uh, Mises Institute, correct? Yeah, I was there for many years. Uh, I had an affiliation there for uh, 25 years. I built. You know, the website Mises Org and stuff like that. And then the opportunity came along. Let's say it was an interesting company. It was built, founded in 1972, and it had a hard time kind of leaping into the digital age in some way, you know, and so it began to kind of falter in the late 90s. And then it kind of, uh, you know, changed hands a lot. It finally landed over at Agora Financial in Baltimore, and they thought I would be the one to help them move from fantastic uh, losses to profitability, and I'm pleased to say that in the course of about 15 minutes, uh, that's happened. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <Yeah. laughs> we were just talking before you called um, about people, the glorification of socialism and how so many times we hear, you know, on the news media from the state, whatever, the uh, that capitalism is the destruction of America. Capitalism is why we have all these horrible things going on. I mean, the markets, why everything's failed, why we have these crashes and everything. And one of the things that I really like about you is your explanation of capitalism, the free market, and how absolutely wonderful it is. Well, it's, it, it, it seems so incredibly obvious, but you know, sometimes the most obvious things you have to actually point out in order for, for them to be, to be clear to people. But, you know, all the stuff we use in our normal lives, everything we do, everything we eat, you know, where we live, you know, the decorations in our, in our house, the technology we use, um, you know, the, from, the, from the soap and our showers, you know, to our smartphones, to our uh, the Bloody Marys, many people be drinking the violent money on Easter. Everything is provided to us by the market, and the market is bestowed upon on us so many beautiful things. And, and especially in our time, but really in all time. I mean, the market has built civilization uh, incrementally, uh, you know, uh, one step at a time, century by century. The market itself is older than any existing nation state. And the capital that it's provided us and gives us is, you know, extends essentially all the way back to the ancient world. And, yeah. That knowledge base that the market has provided us is what makes civilization pick. And it hurts me, actually, deeply when I hear people cutting it down. It's like, it's like people are attacking their benefactors or something. And it troubles me, and, and, and it disturbs me. And I, that's why I go out of my way to celebrate you know, market activity. And, and I truly get excited in my life um, just shopping or... Uh, you know, talking with anybody deeply involved in a commercial activity, I think it's really, uh, it's a magical, wonderful, thrilling world. I mean, I love to look at corporate balance sheets. I mean, I, uh, I, I marvel at uh, their existence and just the, the human service that's involved in markets. To me, the free market, the economy, is just a gigantic social service project. I and mean, that's essentially what it is. And it's the only one that's really ever worked. <laughs> Even McDonald's. The only yeah. one, isn't it the only one that's really truly voluntary, too? Yeah, that's, you know, that's the other thing about it is that no, no, no business person can take for granted uh, his or her customers. You know, every day, you know, they, they, they can show up early, they turn on the lights, 
what can, what can they do to make sure that people come into the store? What do you do to make sure people come to your website? It's not enough just to build it. They will not come. That is a big myth. <laughs> you have to entice people in there, and you have no way that you can be certain that, you know, uh, people aren't going to just turn around tomorrow and uh, decide to stop purchasing your product or your service. And so you you never rest. Uh, it's always a kind of an active phase. You always have to get the inventory before you can sell the inventory. So you have to kind of take a speculative leap into the future. You have to build the thing and, and try to anticipate what the consuming public might want. So, you know, there's a kind of an element of... Um, you have, to, you have to sort of be very alive to uh, what it is that people want. So it's not enough just to want to make money, for example. Uh, you have to really want to serve others in order to be successful. And you have and to buy radio things. advertising. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> buy, buy, buy radio advertising. <laughs> Maybe that's the key. I don't, you know, it's, what's funny is that there's no real one formula for success in entrepreneurship because it's always change all the time and when you talk to people involved in the industry and you know something works on Monday and you think great I'll repeat it on Tuesday and you try it on Tuesday and it flops you know so <laughs> there's, there's, some of the most humble people you'll ever know are those that are deeply involved in commercial enterprise because they begin to realize they don't know everything in fact they don't hardly know anything they've just got a series of hunches and guesses and sometimes it works, and most of the time it doesn't. And why anybody goes into merchant craft, sometimes it, it amazes me uh, that anybody bothers at all because it's extremely difficult, especially in our time where you have so many government regulations and taxes and terrible monetary policies that are sort of constantly conspiring against capitalism, making it more difficult than it should otherwise be. Yeah. We've said s several times here that uh, the market is so amazing that even in spite of the state, it still flourishes. Mm -hmm. And we live in a society yeah. now that that has come to this thought that it's because of the state that there's a market. Right. That's the unfortunate thing of the market being so amazing is that people start to attribute it to um, socialism and democracy. Yeah, there was this case, actually, I think last year where there was a, a kind of urban myth that developed that Obama was giving everybody free phones. I don't, I don't know if you ever if you followed that at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and which it turns out you know it wasn't the case at all. It was actually spent. Uh, but you know, unfortunately, a whole class of people are sort of you know, led to believe that somehow this was the, the government invented the smartphone and was giving giving them away to everybody, and that's that's, that's a benefactor. Government always likes to sweep in and pretend as if it's the great hero of the day. Uh, it's not. And it's it's really not. You find this all the time when you, even in things like social affairs. For example, uh, do you remember it was, it was 15 years ago or so that there was these laws passed to stop sexual harassment and and you know at the workplace. And if anybody's ever watched Mad Men, you know you're sort of you know you know disgusted by you know, the sort of workplace uh, treatment of. Um, uh, women in particular, but the, the society had begun to change, and that was already kind of going away and can be being competed out. And governments have swept in with these new laws that, that ban the practice. I, I think there's an element here that you know government sort of wants to be given credit for anything that the market is actually achieving on its own. Otherwise, uh, it was the case of spam. I mean, a few years ago. You know, just as spam arrest was coming along and Google was inventing this great spam, uh, email checkers and everything else, Congress made spam illegal, you know, so it could, you know, then take credit for the elimination of spam. Well, that law didn't do any good whatsoever, but it does make politicians, uh, allow them to sort of strut around as, as the heroes of the day. Sure, they've always got to have a reason to exist. Even if they mm -hmm. have to, well, they have to invent all their reasons to exist, which are a good reason. And there's a big myth out there. I think that people tend to credit government uh, for everything. It's a little bit silly in a way because, um, you know, the fact is the government can't be everywhere at once. And most of our lives are conducted uh, based on our own choices. And we all know this. I mean, when we wake up in the morning, uh, we're not awakened by a cop, you know, sort of nudging us with the barrel of a gun saying, hey, buddy. 
you've been asleep long enough. Some, some, to get some up. of us yeah. are. Depends on where we sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, we, we we make our choices, and it works, right? And, and uh, government really has nothing to do with it. Largely, I see government as a, a, a kind of uh, an institution that's exogenous to society that's just kind of living off of us, you know, taking what it can when it can, rewarding its friends at our expense. I mean, that's that's pretty much what what government has devolved to in our time, really. And the market is really the source of all beautiful things. But it's hard for people to sort of get this, I think, if you've been educated otherwise. Um, I, re- I remember a few years ago, um, so I also con- I also conduct a, a choir in my spare time, so I have a very you know ideologically diverse uh, choir. And one of my choir members came to me, she said, oh, Jeffrey, I really have some very serious matters I, I need to talk to you about. And so can we meet for brunch? And I said, well, okay, yeah, that's fine. And I thought it was going to be about, she wanted to be switched from soprano to alto or something like that. No, it turned out she had been reading some of my other writings <clears throat> and uh, she wanted to kind of talk about politics. And I thought, well, it's not my favorite subject, but okay. <laughs> so we, we went to a very fancy uh, hotel where they had a kind of, it's one of these all-you-can-eat brunches, you know, uh, or, or lunches. And, you know, they had, you know, five different entrees and an entire salad bar and uh, breads all freshly cooked, you know, that morning. And just, you know, fabulous seafood stews. And I, it was plush and luxurious and the environment was lovely. The chairs were puffy and the candles were beautiful, and everything was just dreamy. The music was playing. And we sit down, and uh, she says to me, she says, well, here's my problem. I'll just tell you frankly. Um, I think the free market that you're always going on about is exploitative and evil, and I'm just a dedicated socialist. What do you think about that? And uh, I remember at the time just kind of almost being stunned into silence because I'm looking around, and seeing this beautiful display all around me, this gorgeous brunch and this sort of a buffet that, you know, Louis XIV has never had, you know, in the 18th century. You know, kings, even even uh, in the late 19th century, couldn't get this many range of foods from so many different places and have, you know, 50 people being wait, waited on them, you know, and, and only spend seven bucks, which is what the lunch really cost. And I said, well, finally, I, I, you know, I thought, would you think socialism would give us this kind of lunch. I mean, this whole experience we're experiencing right now is is the market at work. Everything, everything you see <laughs> is brought to us by the market. And you know, it turned out she had never really quite looked at it that way before. And she she initially resisted, and then she she granted. Oh yeah, I guess that's right, isn't it? Right. And then she fell back on a series of cliches about the, about the roads and the infrastructure and you know, clean water and global warming, you know, God knows what well, else. But couldn't couldn't you have just asked her if maybe you opened the door to the public and let everybody in for that brunch that maybe that uh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. They probably wouldn't have went around so far, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think I mean yeah, that's right. Let's provide this lunch uh, socialistically and see how how long it'll be offered, right? <laughs> Socialism is a ridiculous idea because, you know, the problem is we live in a world of scarce goods. And so, of course, we have to have private property. We have to have prices to um, make those goods available to us. If we don't have prices to allocate things, then everything will be overutilized and, and ruined very quickly. That's just, that's just the reality. And that will be true so long as we live in this world and we're not in, the, in, the, in heaven. So. Jeffrey, I have, a, I have a question for you. I'm Steve Floyd, the uh, the radio guy here. You, you keep talking about the, the beauty of the market, but what about all of this public-private partnership you keep hearing about lately? We have a l- number of those projects happening here in Alaska. We just heard the the president talking about a private or public-private partnership later on, or earlier this week. Uh, how does how does that fit in with the idea of a free market? And what are companies doing that get in bed with government on these public-private partnerships? Yeah, you know, it's, that's the thing that the 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 people who are least um, least big fans of capitalism tend to be the capitalists themselves. I mean, competition is a very rough thing, 
and uh, capitalists don't usually like it because it requires relentless innovation. They can have their ideas stolen at any time. You know, they have to always, as you as we pointed out earlier, they have to always have consumers for their products, and you know, it's a hard life. So sometimes government, uh, big corporations get tired of that, and they go to government. And they say, and they say, you know, save us, help us, protect us. Uh, we're tired of this whole system, and. So that's when the public-private partnership is born. And it's a very wicked system that exploits people and exploits consumers. And, and it's a, increasingly a problem, actually, in the United States. We're seeing more of this, especially under Obama. I mean, we've seen whole industries come about that otherwise wouldn't even exist were it not for government support. And they're just simply not sustainable. But they keep trying it because why do they do... Why do the politicians do this? Well, mainly because the businesses, it's like a big uh, kind of racket. You know, they, they get big election support and contributions from corporations uh, to whom they give a uh, special favor. That's, that's the way it works. It's just a big kind of shakedown operation, essentially, and it and exploits people, and it's terrible. It also helps discredit the market. Uh, this disturbed me very much, you know, after 2008, when, of course, the Fed and the Treasury and the Congress and the president, also the president, all kind of got together and decided to bail out, you know, all their favorite uh, large corporations. And, uh, you know, the left, the socialists were saying, oh, look, see what's happening? Capitalism is, is corrupt. Well, that's not capitalism. It's, you know, some other kind of system. Um, it's fascism made possible by the existence of socialistic uh, uh, ownership. Exactly. Essentially. And that's exactly the term I used this week when I was talking to somebody who's proposing exactly that kind of thing here in Alaska. And I was, they, they excoriated me for using that term, fascism. What else uh -huh. could it be? Yeah, you know, I almost kind of, it's funny because fascism is actually a real social system with a real history. Nowadays, the term is used almost as like a curse word in a way. Uh, but it really shouldn't be because it's, it actually refers to a real system of of government. It's not socialism. It doesn't abolish private property, but it does uh, kind of get rid of the, of the uh, private control of resources. But it essentially means the government works with the largest corporations to create monopoly cartels and protect uh, profitability. The fascist, fascist parties in Europe all wanted to get rid of competition because they thought it was, too, uh, too rigorous and required too much of people and was leading, leading to too much turnover in business and was just a, too unstable of a system. So they wanted to kind of you know, cobble together a system that was influenced by socialism but didn't do the stupid stuff that socialism does, like nationalize all the industries and, and uh, things like that or completely abolish private property. So it, it is a real system, and, and in fact... Fascism has probably, if you look at the sweep of the 20th century, been generally more influential as an ideology than socialism or communism and certainly than uh, capitalism. Yeah, I think uh, Mussolini would be proud. Mm. He'd fit right yeah. in. Well, it's right funny, and too, the New Deal was very much influenced by the experience of Mussolini. You know, uh, nowadays we look at Mussolini as, well, he was a bad guy we fought during World War II. Actually, that wasn't true in the early 1930s. So there were New York Times, large New York Times articles written about how great he was. They called him Professor Mussolini and heralded his central plan for the economy. And, you know, New York Times thought he was a genius. They thought he was just great. And many of the early New Deal reformers looked to his to his uh, industrial planning schemes and pricing schemes as, as a kind of a model for how they were going to dig us out of the New Deal. Including Roosevelt himself. Yeah. It's you, really true. You, Jeffrey, something that you said earlier just kind of clicked with me with what you just said about the plan and the model. It seems to me that anybody who steps forward with this idea of, well, here's a plan and how we can fix the economy is ignoring one very simple thing, is that you cannot make someone go and do something unless you're doing so by force. I, it's like what you were saying about the private market and the beauty of people going out there in faith, opening up their doors and saying, will someone come to my shop today? Yeah, and this, is, this point can't be emphasized enough. I mean, essentially the markets mean 
uh, peaceful social relation. Um, I mean, if I if I were a, 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 a member of, of of the left that really genuinely believed in peace and voluntarism and human cooperation and solidarity and all these kind of these terms that you hear thrown around, there's only really one system that actually achieves that, and that's the market. Yeah, I thought it was getting rid of corporations. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a def- big defender of corporations. So, you know, people, people act as if corporations are created by the state. They're not. They actually, they go back to the ancient world. Limit, li- limited liability model is, is uh, a very ancient form of uh, business organization. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, nor is there anything wrong with big business as such. You know, uh, big business in a free market just is an indicator that it's been very successful. And anybody who's, you know, been there from the having one shop, in, you know, to, to 50 uh, knows this. There's a, a woman in my town, I remember uh, a few years ago, she uh, had begun to, uh, she made a really good chicken salad. I'm not a big fan of chicken salad, but I know a lot of people like it. So she made a wonderful chicken salad. People began to ask for a recipe. And then the, the, the moms who asked for the recipe didn't really have time to go to the trouble of making it, so she began to make it for them, and then she began to sell it, sell the stuff, and she became a kind of a, a, a phenom, you know, in suburban neighborhoods. So she started calling herself the chicken salad chick. And, um, and then the health department shut her down because they said, look, you can't be running a commercial enterprise out of your kitchen. So she said, oh, the heck with it. I'll open my own store. So she started you know, a, 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 a business, the chicken salad, chicken, sure enough, you know, that was an enormous success. Well, I think we're talking about two or three years later or something. She has 50 uh, restaurants around, and they're spread all over uh, East Alabama and, and Georgia now. Uh, the chicken salad, chicken, she's planning to, to take this national. Now, I'm sure at some point in this process, there have been people who have denounced the chicken salad, chicken, as being, you know, a big business that, that exploits people. You know, uh, an example of, you know, corruption and evil. Well, she wasn't always big. She got big because she sold really good stuff. She had a good marketing plan and had a good product. That's how she got big. In and in a free market, that's how it works all the time. You know? I, yeah, I have a theory that um, capitalism is the one thing still keeping Americans um, semi-free. The fact that uh, Joe Blow can become Bill Gates tomorrow still puts a dampener on the ultimate power of the state. Yeah, I think even especially in our age now with uh, digital uh, media and everything that's going on, we've been given all kinds of opportunities to communicate, associate, network with each other. Uh, yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with you. This is this has been, you know, imposed certain limits on what, what Congress can do. And in fact, it's given us even more opportunities to kind of Five seconds. Jeff, Jeff, we're up at the break. Can you stay with us? Very good. Yep, I sure can. Excellent, thank you. You've got it on KFAR. Line right there is why this song is the theme for Patriots Lament. I won't bow down, even if the whole world thinks I'm crazy. Welcome to the show. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. Joining us in the studio, we've got Aaron Bennett and Josh Bennett. These are the ones who created this show and who basically make it possible every single week. Joining us also on the phone, a special guest, uh, former Vice President of Mises Institute uh, with uh, Laissez Faire Books. We have Jeffrey Tucker on the line. Good morning, Jeffrey. No, it's nice to, nice to be here. I really love to listen to those. I mean, those are really those are some inspiring stuff there. Yeah, thank you. Those, <laughs> those are uh, those are his kids, by the way. Josh's yeah. children that voice well, that. They're fantastic. I mean, you know, I just I I, I love it, and I suppose it's because most of those kids learned to write. You have to forget the train going by here. Capitalism in the 19th century store is still still happening in my neighborhood. Nice. <laughs> uh, it's it's good, but I I think it's great that the kids are being asked to memorize these things. You know, um, if they are being memorized, uh, Declaration of Independence, a great speech by Patrick Henry. I mean, all those great quotes from the from the founders. You know, that was a, a wonderful generation. They all had faith that they could, you know, build civilization through their through their own actions and their own lives and. Uh, they weren't afraid of freedom, and it's a beautiful thing. I like to see that spirit recaptured. Having kids memorize that stuff is really great, it's just not just as a good, solid civic education. But, you know, exercising the memory is a very important aspect of, of education in general, especially, you know, uh, for young children, and it's not being emphasized enough in uh, public school these days. 
That's why my kids are homeschooled. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course. I mean, homeschoolers are going to take over. Homeschool kids are going to take over the world, uh, and they are. You know, it's a, it's a fabulous thing. Uh, all the educational alternatives that have come along, people don't appreciate the sacrifice involved in home education, because at least one spouse has to put up, you know, um, a, a kind of, um, you know, income, and uh, it can be, you know, a real trial, but it's also very satisfying and. and Thrilling. Sometimes you have to step outside the, the the plan that the government masters have for you in order to uh, build good families and good lives. Yeah. And homeschoolers have done that, and the results speak for themselves, really. Yeah, it's quite fun. Um, my kids just finished with. Uh, I'm sure you you know Richard Mayberry. You've heard of him. Or what? Yes. They. Uh, I was getting lectured here not too long ago by my 14 year old about. Um, Inflation, the, the theft by inflation after he read Penny Candy. <laughs> that was great. That's a great book, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the subject of monetary economics is really intriguing to kids. And it's funny to me that, I've, in my experience, kids are able to understand this a lot better than, like, central bankers for some reason. <laughs> yeah. No yeah. Kidding. Well, and there's Your so kids many... know more than Ben Bernanke. <laughs> yeah. Yes, actually. that's It's amazing, too, that... Um, technologies, especially, you know, the Internet's given us so many wonderful tools to teach now. I mean, you don't, and it costs nothing. I mean, um, education, real education, not indoctrination of the public schools, is free. I mean, if you can yeah. afford to buy the cheapest of Internet, it is absolutely free. You have, um, well, my, right now we've been going through Dr. Wood's um, Liberty Classroom. What a wonderful, mm -hmm. what a wonderful thing. And it just... Hundred bucks a year, and you can be an Austrian economist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot yeah of it's a beautiful thing. thing to see all the educational alternatives that are coming up. In fact, most colleges—not most, but many—have put their full education online, available to anybody. So you have to pay for the degree, but you can get the education for free. Yeah, it's just great. Technology has been such a a wonderful boon, and it's it's. That's, I guess, you know, what I mean about how the market is kind of reinventing the world. I mean, it's kind of figured out so many ways to get around government and make make it possible for us to live wonderful, you know, progressing uh, lives. And I, the way I see the future here really is the market continues to grow. Uh, people, you know, continue to innovate. And eventually, uh, the dumb bureaucratic systems of the government just become, you know, utterly useless to civilization and just crumble and become, you know, less and less relevant to our daily lives. That's, that's how I see it happening. I mean, what, 20 years ago, if you'd said, look, you know, this first class mail stuff's not going to go anywhere. In the future, we're all going to be using email. Uh, people would have said, well, that's crazy. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's really not going to be possible. But in fact, that's in fact what happened. Same with so many of the innovations that are just essential to our lives. You know, the fact that I can just, you know, be on the show right now on a wireless device, you know, talking, you know, the, on a little tiny box that fits in my pocket is an extraordinary thing. It's something that the free market has given us. And we don't know what the free market is going to be able to accomplish in the future. I'm very excited about new currency innovations like uh, Bitcoin, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm... Uh, owner and trader myself and which is I'm coming just, under attack i read here this last week or they're trying to the state's trying to yeah keep. well you know the financial crimes enforcement network sent out a pdf that, you know sort of petting people about it you know but i don't know that it really amounts to much i'm not sure that you know, really it certainly didn't do anything to the price of bitcoin which has gone from 15 dollars up to 90 dollars <laughs> yeah. i think it was a little bit ago you know and and the innovations in Bitcoin just keep progressing just at an astonishing rate. And, and that's because of the merit of the coin itself. It's, it's very much like the old gold standard. You've got a fixed supply. It's expensive to mine. So you just can't create unlimited quantities of it. Um, every Bitcoin has an owner. And those are very carefully checked and logged on a ledger that's uh, public information. And you know, there doesn't have to be an audit the Bitcoin movement because everything is open source and it's managed entirely peer to peer. There's not any banks that need to be bailed out with Bitcoin. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a beautiful institution. It's like 
in many ways, it's better than the old gold standard because the old gold standard, there's a big problem with gold is that it's really heavy. Mm. So that means that you have to have banks that warehouse them. But some of the banks warehouse gold, uh, they have a tendency to want to loan out more than they can really uh, pay back to depositors on demand. So uh, it tempts them into a kind of a moral dilemma, you know. And But with Bitcoin, you don't have that problem um, because it's not heavy. You don't have to have banks. Every Bitcoin owner, you know, the, the account is the same as the, as the bank itself. So you don't have that kind of a tendency for the system to get overinflated and uh, then go bust. Everything's completely open. It's just a, a brilliant market innovation, one of many. What do you, you kind of led into something I was going to ask you with, um, we kind of see, and the Austrians have been talking about for quite a while, the coming, well, I assume it's going to happen, the coming economic collapse or the collapse of the states. Do you, do you really think that's going to happen? What do you think? What do people do? I mean, people always call us and say, you always complain and tell us the world's coming to an end, blah, blah, blah. But we don't think it's going to come to an end. But, so what What do people do? I mean, do they well, I buy gold? They, do they buy silver? Do they, what do they do to be ready for? Well, I would say, yeah, the, the way to be ready for it is, uh, first of all, it's already happening. I mean, anybody who's planning uh, his or her retirement based on uh, Social Security promises, you know, is just foolish, right? I mean, so, uh, whereas, you know, 50 years ago, everybody believed that this was going to provide, you know, endless uh, financial security for everybody, and that's just not true. Uh, you know, in the old days, people believed a lot of silly things, but that people no longer believe. So I, I say the public institutions are already uh, collapsing. I think we all need to kind of be prepared to live life without the state in the future, we should prepare our lives that way. And uh, that means taking, you know, direct responsibility for our lives and not not hoping that somebody's going to save us down the line because nobody is going to be there to save us other than friends, family, and churches and these kind of private institutions. I think as individuals, we need to prepare for that by using as many technological tools as possible. Um, you know, it's a wonderful thing that workers today um, – can develop their own private networks uh, and the, their own sort of communication infrastructure, you know, by using tools like uh, LinkedIn and, and uh, Twitter and Facebook and all these other kinds of things. They can, they can, they can develop their own sort of private civilizations, uh, their own little micro civilizations based on their own activities. And those are important for sort of protection in the future. Uh, that's why I really recommend that people, you know, throw themselves into this digital media and and, um, and exploit it, you know, to their own uh, personal benefit. Uh, the great danger I see for people, the biggest sort of error that people make is to get into debt. If, if you can get out of debt, you can get on the path towards a good life. But so long as you're uh, sort of saddled with debt, then um, you're going to be stuck. And uh, that's a problem. It's a serious problem for young people today, too, uh, just given the prevalence of student loans and these sorts of things. So if you can, it was better. I think it's better for most people to choose not to go to college rather than to uh, find themselves enslaved to a kind of uh, twenty, thirty-year uh, note that they have to pay. And there's no bankruptcy, you know, for student debt. It's really a calamity for kids. So th those kinds of things are very important. Financial independence, uh, you know, uh, you need to be saving most of your income. That's another big temptation people face when they get out into the workforce. They want to ramp up their lifestyles as soon as possible, get a big home, fill up full of furniture. Um, but we're told you know, that savings, on, on we're told now that savings, you know, saving your money, you'll never get rich by saving. Well... That's the thing. Bernanke and his friends don't want you to save money. They want you to spend as much as possible. My view is that you should just do the opposite. But if that means, you know, stocking away cash in a bank, that's, that's, that's you know, yeah, you're not going to get a huge reward for it, but on the other hand, you're going to stay free. Especially I, if I not if you live are, in Cyprus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, and that's a problem. So this is where gold uh, can be a good thing. I think Bitcoin at this point is, is a really good alternative, silver ownership and taking physical possession. 
is good. Anything you can do to kind of privatize your life in the sense that, but by that I mean take direct responsibility for it and don't depend on, on others, and particularly don't depend on large corporations to somehow save you or, or government to save you. Uh, so stay out of debt, save as much money as possible in as many diverse forms as, as possible, uh, develop a good, solid private network that can help you in the future, that you can count on the future when you start your business. Uh, those are really good steps mm-hmm. towards having a good life. Yep. And I also think a business is a, is a... I know that we're still kind of struggling with a recessionary uh, climate, you know, in, in the U.S., but uh, still... You know, the, the commerce is a really viable path for people. I don't think government work is something that people ought to be looking at at this point. Uh, uh, that, to, to me, is a prescription for a depressing life. You know, all the surveys show that government workers are much less happy in general than uh, people who work for the private sector. So find a good private sector job. Uh, don't spend up to the limit of your spending capacity. Save as much money as you can. Stay free and independent. Be prepared to move and seize on new opportunities and take risks in life. Uh, you have to have that kind of financial independence so that you can take an opportunity when it comes along. Mm-hmm. That's that's extremely uh, crucial. And not be not be uh, saddled down and not be not be tied tied down to a single institution. I think it's extreme. my father used to always give me that advice. And as I've gotten older, I've I've realized just the wisdom of it. Absolutely crucial, especially in our time. I'm expecting big changes in the future, big upheaval. Hmm. Oh, another thing that young people need to really do right now is uh, they need to learn code uh, and computers. If you have a, a kid who's interested in computers, that's something that you should encourage, I think. Um, let them play around and and uh, and uh, find you know, figure out code, and if 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 you have a basic code class, you can kind of figure out the way the modern world works. I think it's extremely important. There's wonderful opportunities coming in the digital area. Hmm. You said something about m- being able and willing to move. What What are your thoughts about, um, well, I'll just bring up Doug Casey's Galtz, Gulch down in Argentina, and I see uh, Mr. Jeff Berwick is working on something similar in Chile. Is that right. something... Um, I'm actually very interested in Chile myself. Is that something yeah. Americans should look at as a possible? Well, and, uh, and my own company has a has a big ranch in Nicaragua, where where it's taking a lot of uh, you know expatriates uh, from the U.S. that are buying property down there, and it's really secure and very beautiful. Um, you have to have again, in order to pursue that kind of thing, you have to be out of debt and um, you know have a lot of money saved and be prepared to start a new life. I, I think it's a, a, a fascinating thing. I just talked to somebody yesterday who was a big activist in the Von Paul campaign who um, just felt like she couldn't take it in the U.S. anymore with the rise of the police state and decided to move to New Zealand. I just picked up and, and moved. She bought a scooter and found a place to live, and now she's looking for a job, and that's what she's going to make her home now. You know, So some people are, are up to that. I, I think it's a good thing for young people. I mean, you know, our ancestors moved a long way. My my uh, my great great grandfather was a very happy uh, eldest son of a uh, uh, Congregationalist minister in the Boston area of Massachusetts, who got a flyer one day that said, "Move to Texas, you know, where you can build a new life and experience great great uh, freedom." And he had a really good life in Boston. He could have chose that, but he decided he, he wanted to embrace the adventure. So he he did. He was one of the first earliest settlers of the southwest region of Texas. He picked up and, and moved. He became a Texas Ranger for a while, then he opened up a blacksmith shop and uh, had a big boot of kids and, you know, they 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 built that. And it's the same thing happened all throughout the 19th century. People left, went long distances. I just finished a novel by Rosewater Lane called... Uh, Whatever uh, her. Pioneer, I think it was something, uh, forget now the, the name of the book, it's something Pioneers, Young Pioneers. Brilliant book about early settlers in the Dakota region. Have you ever read uh, Discovery of Freedom? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I love Discovering Freedom. It's, it's, it's an amazing book. This is her a kind of a novel version of that, actually. It was written probably 30 years earlier. Um, but yeah, just those people that faced amazing, what, the, what they were willing to take on as personal sacrifice in order to have their own freedom, in order to have independence, was extraordinary and inspiring. I, that could be our future. Um, you know, and we're not used to that. I think as parents, we uh, are all alarmed at the prospect of our kids, you know, moving out and finding, you know, better opportunities elsewhere. But, you know, we have to remember that that's, how our country was built. I guess that's my main theme. You know, when my great-great-grandfather left uh, his father, uh, his father must have, in, in some way, you know, been very sad and brokenhearted to see, the, see his son leave. But he also understood that every generation has to find its own way. And 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 uh, if freedom is calling, independence, the dream of freedom and independence is calling, you know, sometimes people have to pick up and, and go. Uh, I'm I'm not... Personally, of that mind, uh, I'm a little more optimistic about the United States than many people are. But, but I must tell you that when I travel, I'm always startled at that. Um, you know, there's there's more freedom to be had in other places around the world. I mean, just hanging around in Spain or Vienna or in Nicaragua or any of the other places I've recently traveled, I'm I'm startled. I feel in a way freer than I do here in the U.S. Well, even the Heritage Institute, I think, has the U.S. in economic freedom down to number 10. Number 13 by some measures, 13? yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. We're doing worse by the day. <laughs> yes, yeah, doing worse by the day. I yeah, think... and yeah, it's not going to be, I mean, we can't hold on to this sort of imperial thing that we've had going for the last 100 years. That's definitely coming to an end. I mean, yeah, that's, that's changing. Americans don't recognize that and don't realize that, but... Um, uh, if you look at just the growth rates, I mean, our economy is just simply not growing. And there are other places around the world, like in China and Malaysia and uh, Indonesia, where you're seeing growth rates that, at least by the official statistics, are between 8 and 10%. Hmm. You know, it doesn't take too many years for for another region of the world to just totally outclass the U.S. in every every respect. Wow. Yeah, just looking at the humbling. living standard and how the living standards are rising around the world, but falling here. You look at how many yeah. people are going on food stamps here. Yeah. Why, why are they going on food stamps? Because they don't have it, enough it, money, just right? Absurd. Yeah, well, and also because all the incentives are set up that way. I mean, <laughs> U.S. we talked about public-private corporations. I mean, the U.S. food industry is very much anxious for a big government subsidy. The funny thing about food stamps is it's not administered by a welfare agency. It's administered by the Department of Agriculture because it's a big subsidy to the corporate farmers. Right. So they want to get as many people on the dole as possible. That's what they want. They want more clients. If they can't get them by selling groceries the normal way, way they'll uh, find a different way to do it. Most people, like you said, though, is... Um they're not going to be able to move out. That's right. And so I think it's important what you were talking about earlier. And it's not just um, you know getting out of debt, but also personally seceding, basically. But that's basically what you do when you leave a country. It's like the the colonists when they came over, they were seceding from where they were. And, uh, yeah, that's right. Hans Hoppe talks about that a lot: is personal secession. If you can't secede, you're not free. Hmm. Yeah, you have to you have to be prepared to kind of you know live outside the plan, and that's why I think homeschooling is such a such an exciting thing. But uh, it could involve other other uh, dramatic choices, like sending your kid to college sooner than they otherwise you know would normally. Maybe at fourteen is not a bad age, you know. Who knows? Or maybe not sending them to college at all. There's just there's many different ways. You know, every entrepreneur starts a new business in a way of seceding from the status quo. You know, it's just a matter of rethinking the world and seizing on opportunities. And I don't care how bad things get in the U.S. There's always still opportunities there for people. They just have to open their eyes, uh, see them, and take the risk and take the leap and jump into it. As long as there's people, there will be needs <laughs> that have That's to be right. filled. We're, uh, what's our... We've got about uh, two minutes before the break here at the bottom of the hour. The Fox News coming up. We've got uh, three lines on hold. 
And we've got that question that you asked earlier off air, Josh. Right. I was going to ask you, maybe we should wait till after the break here, but just a quick, we'd like to expound, let's see, we love to hate the state. <laughs> and I was going to ask you, I was watching your presentation, the Mises Circle in Colorado Springs a few years back on how government is unraveling civilization by force. Mm-hmm. And... I thought that was just fantastic. It, you brought up one of the deals where the, the IRS, their building in, I think, D.C. has a big sign above their building or wherever it is that says, uh, you know, taxes are the price we pay for civilization. Right. So I got to thinking about that. I am one of the most civilized people in Fairbanks then. <laughs> 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 because I pay way too much. And yet uh, my wife would agree that that's not true by any means. <laughs> So we, Any, anyone who's had dinner with you would, would say that, yeah. Not, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I liked what you brought up about, you know, in ancient times, how people could barely survive, you know, their life expectancy, all these things. And would we, would have they have been better off if for some reason they had Homeland Security or Barack Obama or any of those things? Yeah, I don't think there's any, any of these institutions, whether it's taxes or Homeland Security, contribute anything to the building of our civilization. We all know... The truth, if we reflect on our own individual lives, uh, we are responsible for building our own civilization. I mean, we're the reason that we have security and we have prosperity and we have order. It's, it's, it's what you do in your own life that matters, and nobody's going to do it for you. I don't care how much they claim otherwise. Home, uh, TSA is always claiming to protect you. You know, I always love that. Uh, we're protecting you. But we all know that that's not true. What they're doing is stealing our stuff and harassing us and, you know, sort of ruining airports, making us arrive much earlier than we otherwise should. More have. Patriots I mean, Lament coming up in just seconds with Jeffrey Tucker on the line. Fox. And welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio, but we're streaming live on the web at KFAR660.com. And you can find us on your smartphone if your phone is smart. All you have to do is download the free TuneIn radio app. And you can be listening to us in mere moments. This is Patriots Lament with Josh Bennett and Aaron Bennett in the studio today. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. And joining us on the line is Jeffrey Tucker calling in from Parts Unknown. Oh. I wanted to make a comment there about you guys left off. I had to leave the room for a minute but came back um, there at the end. I usually don't like to talk about the symptoms because it's the cause that matters, and you guys were kind of hitting on symptoms there, but I just saw that they're pushing legislation through introduced by the FBI to start uh, monitoring Skype, uh, yeah, emails, Gmail, Facebook, all the way down to words with friends. They're pushing that through to, um, and they had a constitutionalist on there, uh, advising the whole thing and he said well you know in light of terrorism and terrorism and that's the only word that came out of his mouth was terrorism that we need to give the fbi the authorization to crack into everything in the cyber world it seems like they see the um internet as one of the biggest threats to the state out there right now yeah well you're right to see the, the that this is just kind of propaganda <clears throat> but the biggest claim nowadays is that they say that that our, our our cyber networks are uh, in danger and vulnerable to exploitation by foreign terrorists, and so we need the government to kind of swing in and protect us. And which we all know is not true. I think everybody understands that what's really going on is government's just trying to seek the right to uh, <coughs> to spy on us. I mean, uh, in other words, they're not our friends. These guys, they're actually the the, the biggest problem we've had. We face a much bigger threat from our own government than we do from so-called cyber terrorists. What's very impressive to me is how many activists have been involved in, <clears throat> in stopping these kind of measures. It's actually been extraordinary. We've beat back something like a half dozen attempts over the last two years to um, monitor uh, our, 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 our lives on, online, to impose legislation that would essentially abolish the Internet, like SOPA a few years ago. Yeah. And... Um, and we've we've stopped these things through all these new forms of activism, um, all of which kind of harness these digital networks to let uh, politicians in Washington know what people are really think about these things. I'm not really into political activism that much. Um, really, I'm not really convinced it is too effective. But this kind of political activism has, in fact, been very effective. It's kind of forming 
uh, uh, Capitol Hill with with uh, communication, and you can do it very quickly. I like you know institutions like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, these others that really are active in stopping this kind of legislation. They have put together some excellent campaigns to uh, so far uh, be back to these kinds of things. There's a lot of resistance because you know these days people aren't, aren't as stupid. You know we're, we're not easily bamboozled by a fireside chat. You know, we, we we have our own networks online. We have our websites that we read and our apps that we look at. And, and people are highly informed now. We're not, we're not as in the dark as we used to be. And I think, in a way, we're in a much better position now to kind of defending our own freedoms and beating back these attempts to control us than we ever have been. What do you say to people? We this the the biggest complaint we get here, as we uh, denigrate the state and wish for its non-existence. <laughs> That's actually a daily thing, but we get to talk about it on Saturday. So, people call in and they say, "But we must," even though they admit to the very evil of the state. They say it's a necessary evil. And what would we do? What would we do if we didn't have the state? Where, how would we defend ourselves? We're, we would all obviously be just killing each other, robbing each other. Right. I, I always ask the question, which I just did about two days ago. I was in a pretty heated debate with a guy. He was a libertarian, and he was espousing for the smallest and most limited government that could ever be. And I kept asking him what what extent of... What what amount of uh, theft and force is justified? You know, he wanted smaller and less of it, but what amount is okay? And he never could answer that question. But people still will hold on to it and dear to it. What do you? Yeah, think? it's a, li- a little bit funny because <clears throat> these people, and I, I know exactly the kind of person you're referring to. These so-called uh, minarchists or people yes. who imagine that uh, that that state should do this but not that. And if you think about the left and the right in this country. Nobody actually advocates, like, a totalitarian state. I mean, the left wants the government to have massive social welfare, but then stay out of, you know, the institution of marriage or private life or whatever. You know, the right wants, you know, uh, global war and low taxes, which I don't know how that's going to work out. <laughs> um, and Or they want, you know, cultural center, central plan. Everybody has a plan for what they want the state to do and a plan for what they want the state not to do. The problem is that not everybody can get their way. And I'm particularly intrigued by, by as you described, a libertarian who imagines that you can just kind of uh, restrict government to its essential functions. So the, the problem with that is that the same people who admit that they can't centrally plan an economy and that we have to let that kind of spontaneously evolve through uh, trial and error. Uh, and yet they have a very strict plan for how they're going to centrally designed the state. And, and if you think of it, it's ridiculous. I mean, all of us have more control as economic actors over the way the economy works than we have over the state. None of us can tell the state what to do or what not to do. Once you have the state, it's essentially unleashed. It can do essentially whatever it wants unless the people uh, revolt and say no. I'm always intrigued by that because it's almost like they have a kind of a fully worked out system in their own minds for what the state should do. But the same people admit that you can't ever do that when it comes to economics. Um, and typically these minarchists, so-called, will um, be supporters of things like the criminal justice system or think that the state has to provide courts you know, to enforce contracts and things like that. But we've learned more recently, just through experience, that actually markets are quite good at arbitration and are really bad at institutions like criminal justice. We have a jail population in the United States of something like 2.3 million people, uh, a very large number of whom never did anything violent to anybody. So this whole system is kind of not working anymore, and that seems really obvious. So even those parts of the state that the old-fashioned minarchists, you know, believed in have shown themselves to be, you know, complete failures. I'm, I'm in favor of privatizing any aspect of the state that we can we can privatize, and any part of it, anywhere, anytime. Get get the government out of out of everything because everything will thrive more without the state than it currently does with the impositions and burdens that the state has imposed upon them. 
Yeah, it's pretty hard to get a good service from someone that has the monopoly on its service and a monopoly on how much you're going to pay for such services. Yeah, that's precisely right. Once you turn over all the guns to the government and say, make our laws, take whatever property you want, tell us what to do, you know, that's just not a good, a very good plan. Uh, that's going to fail every single time. And it has failed again and again. They're quite willing to do that, though. That's they're our, yeah. our benefactors. Yeah. They'd be more than happy if we would do that, I'm sure. But yeah, I'm and, and I, don't, I don't shy away from this term anarchism. I sometimes use it as a way to kind of uh, shock people a little bit. But what I really mean by that is that essentially... <clears throat> You know, the belief that society can manage itself, that we can we can construct our own lives and, uh, uh, you know, build the best possible civilization through human choice and voluntarism rather than relying on, you know, uh, trusting uh, Leviathan to somehow get it right. They never get it right. They never have gotten it right. They always take liberties. They take our liberties. I don't think take the, our property. the institution of theft can't get much right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've resorted to calling myself a jurist naturalist in keeping with Richard Mayberry just just for the fact that anarchism has such a bad name. I mean, yeah. I never noticed till recently that it seems like so many TV shows, so many movies, so many uh, ho um, Hollywood things subliminally bash on anarchism. It's just funny. People have a huge taboo against it. So I yeah, uh, you know, it's probably because I live in an academic town that that term is a little more successful to me because yeah. uh, people are a little more uh, you know willing to consider unusual points of view. But you know, I think we have to craft the message based on the audience, really, essentially, uh, and willing to adapt the words we use. I mean, I don't have a huge investment in any particular term. I mean, if I use the term libertarian and somebody says, oh, I hate libertarians, I'll, I'll say, well, okay, well, let's forget that term and try a different one, you know? <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, I don't believe that anybody really in his or her, her heart or soul really hates freedom. I mean, there may be some people like that, uh, just like there are always trolls in any internet forum. You know, maybe it's 2% of the population, maybe 1% of the population. But by and large... Uh, you know, most everybody in the world longs for uh, liberty and choice. And uh, I think we can tap into that. And it's just a matter of enlightening people that the kind of world that allows maximum liberty and maximum choice is going to be a more peaceful, productive, flourishing world for everybody, whatever your vocation in life happens to be, whether you're religious or atheist or gay or straight or black or white, or, you know, it doesn't matter. Whatever life you want to pursue is best pursued in the context of liberty and choice and uh, lines of ownership. And we have a tradition or a heritage of that here in America. And I'm just unfortunately losing that tradition and heritage. But yeah, I, I, that's why I really enjoyed listening to quotations by the by the, by the founders because. I mean, you, you read the writings of, of Jefferson or, or, or Thomas Paine or any of these people, and what you find is a real confidence, that uh, a real faith, really, that if we just let things alone and let people go about their own business in peaceful ways, that we'll get the best possible social uh, result. Isn't that part of the uh, problem, though, is that people don't mind their own business? <laughs> I mean, we're always yeah. trying to deny yeah. rights to some group here or there, say, I, I want my own special rights, but you don't get them. That's it. And the government really introduces what, you know, we call like a moral hazard. It tempts people to be jerks all the time. <laughs> you know, if, if it's out there, if the, if the levers of power are out there to allow you to hurt, hurt others, uh, people are glad to, to use them, which is why we so desperately need to dismantle that. Would you mind? Should we try? Would you mind taking calls? Just oh, in the last few minutes, we have to. Okay, yeah. let's all right. Do that. Uh, we're going to cross our fingers and make sure this uh, this works here. So if we somehow get this connected to you, please call back. <laughs> okay. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Are you still there? Yeah, this is Randy. Good morning, Randy. Hi there. Uh, I really appreciate your guest uh, supporting the free enterprise system. I'm a strong supporter of the free enterprise system. Last hour, he talked about spam on the internet and how the free enterprise 
system comes up with defenses against spam. Same thing with viruses and uh, and other uh, cyber attack things. I've got a free enterprise system on my computer, Norton Antivirus Internet Security. However, um, I read an article just now about uh, cyber crime back in November 8, 2008, against a company called World Pay US, in which there was this elaborate international scheme actually to suck out money. Uh, during a 12-hour period on that day in 2008 from these ATM machines. And the FBI investigated it. And then finally, in uh, the year 2012, uh, they prosecuted one of the ladies that was involved with one of the teams going around sucking money out of the ATM. So my question is, uh, yes, free enterprise system, uh, you know, systems to guard the computers is important, but isn't it good also to have, as a team, as a partner, the FBI... uh, uh, investigating and then ultimately prosecuting participants to help us out to keep our computers safe. Most of these kind of cyber crimes are not discovered by the FBI. They're usually discovered by private users. In fact, I would say 100% of them are. I mean, if you think about you talk to people who work at the FBI, they'll tell you that uh, it's a big lumbering bureaucracy like any other, and they're not actually sitting around going, hmm, let's, let's see if we can find the, the bad guys out here. What usually happens is that they're discovered by private enterprise first, and then the FBI sort of swings in there. And the problem is that the powers that the FBI uses are also used not against criminals, but against uh, innocent uh, people. If they only did good things, I I would see them as defensible. But the problem is that the power is mostly used to not not punish criminals, but to punish uh, the rest of us. Or create them. I don't think they... Yeah, yeah, or create them. I I don't... You know, if you look at something... Like the governance system of of uh, PayPal, it's entirely private, and it and it works. There are, there are trolls, there are scam artists, there are bad guys everywhere, and that's always going to be true. Uh, the question is, you know, what's the best way to deal with them? And mostly online, uh, in, uh, online security, they've, there's been ways that people have figured out how to uh, to stop them. I think your example of Norton is is a good one, and there are thousands of cases of this. It's actually really, it's kind of a well-policed system, the Internet. And it took a while. You know, 10 years ago, it was the Wild West. Uh, well, I shouldn't even use that, because Wild West was the Wild West. <laughs> Shame <laughs> on you. Shame yeah, on you. Yeah, right, right, Not right. Not so. But it was a kind of a, a, a developing system. But now, you know, if you want to get a secure search, you know, for your website, uh, you have to kind of jump through a lot of hoops. I mean, people... Identity theft has always been a problem, so we had the market's innovative mechanisms to p- protect against that. So, you know, every time there's a problem out there in the digital world, there's an entrepreneur out there providing, you know, a wonderful solution. And so, do we, and, and, do we yeah. throw 2 million people in jail where 91% of them have not harmed anyone just to catch that one person that may have harmed someone? Thank, thanks for the yeah. call, Randy. Appreciate the call. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I understand why people are sympathetic to to some of these things. But, you know, a, a lot of times you look into these cases carefully, you find that where well, the government claims to have done something wonderful, that actually it was private enterprise that initiated uh, the thing in the first place. Private enterprise is much more alert to criminality than government really is. And the government's involvement actually ended up, if you talk to the main players, and it ended up slowing down prosecution, uh, gumming up the work, prosecuting people who didn't do anything wrong, uh, abusing their power. This is often the case. So I just I would like to see government completely out of the Internet and in every conceivable way. And in the case of the FBI, lately we've seen that they are behind the origination of the crime in the first place. Yeah, in many cases it's true. I mean, they wrote some of the earliest viruses, uh, killer viruses, and... Uh, yeah, wanting to spy on our accounts and yeah, very bad stuff. In fact, I mean, the FBI sting operations. You know, people talk about you know uh, online solicitation of minors for sex, for sex and things like that on on the internet. One of the major practitioners of this is actually the government. You know, they're in their sting operations. It's incredible how often this is the case, actually. Want to take another call? We can do that. 458-TALK is the number. All right, we cleared the lines. I have a question for you, uh, Jeffrey, and I maybe 
it's my radicalism kicking in here, but I'm thinking to myself that I'd kind of like to push back a little bit against being surveilled upon. Is there anything that I can do? You know, you're talking about digital spying and, and whatnot. Is there anything that I can do to protect myself from that without breaking the law myself? Yeah, yeah, well, some, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. You know, people, you know, private enterprise, there's, there's a driving force on the Internet to make everything you do public, you know. And this is true especially in social media. Uh, like, you have to be careful what apps you authorize on Facebook. You know, somebody sends you an app says, oh, we'd love for you to do you know, such and such, join us in our chat room, whatever. You go and you authorize the app, and it'll, it'll tell you the default setting is to, you know, to announce to all your Facebook friends exactly, you know, what you're doing. Uh, that's a kind of something, uh, you know, an idea you should definitely reject. But you need to be aware uh, of how to use these computers. Uh, don't authorize every app you're invited to. You know, that's a, maybe that sounds like common sense, but I don't think it's such common sense because people often do this all the time. Uh, people need to get better about using their privacy settings on their browsers. Um, if you're ever going to do something you think the government's not going to like, always use a really nice extension called uh, Tor, T-O-R, um, that is a special browser that scrambles your IP address so nobody can ever find it. What's, so what's, that, called, what's that called again? Tor. It's called Tor, T-O-R. And many, many institutions sort of cooperate in hosting uh, Tor. What it does is it, it throws your IP address around in some of these directions and places that it becomes utterly untraceable uh, who you are and allows you to engage, really, in real time, uh, anyone, anywhere, put a comment on a website or buy something online or whatever, without the, having your IP address uh, traced. You don't have to use it all the time, but if you ever have any doubts um, that somebody's trying to track you or steal your identity or spy on your activities, uh, Tor Browser will absolutely prevent that. We even see, uh, I, I read here in the last, I think I read it on LouRockwell.com, uh, some private enterprises coming up with some ideas to prevent drone spying on us. So just another example of the market yeah. stepping up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are apps you can download, too. Uh, Ustream has a really nice app that you can download that will uh, broadcast anything happening anywhere in real time on a real live channel and archive it. So if you feel like you're being harassed, you know, by police or whatever, you just pull up that app, press one button, it'll immediately start recording everything and say, confiscate your phone, it's too late. That's how we've been broadcast out there. That's how a lot of the videos of police abuse are getting on uh, YouTube. It's just through this one simple app. So we're in a really good position these days to be able to uh, chronicle uh, abuse in a way that hasn't been possible in the past. This is why government doesn't like you to bring your cell phones into its office. <laughs> what, what, was that, what was that app called again, the, the one for your cell phone? Um, it's Ustream. Ustream. Yeah, download the Ustream app. Nice. And uh, you can, yeah, I mean, you can go live. And it, I mean, I could go live right now and show you everything that's going on in my office. Sure. And it would uh, broadcast uh, on the internet immediately and archive it automatically. Hmm. So that's, a, that's, that's great stuff. Yeah, it is good and stuff. these apps, these so apps like this are coming online every day. So there, there are solutions. So it's funny. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about Rosado Lane's book, The Young Pioneers. Now, I like that book a lot because it, it, it deals with the barriers that we face in life. So the first settlers in the North Dakota territories, they face terrible threats of hunger and disease, weather that wiped out the crops, uh, hordes of grasshoppers suddenly descending to eat all the wheat and starve everybody out. Terrible things that were kind of built into the structure of the state of nature, you know. Well, we don't face the same kind of problems now. You don't have grasshopper hordes and, and weather we can mostly deal with and hunger is not an issue. We have other problems. Most of our other problems come down to government. I mean, government is the new grasshopper horde. It's the new tornado, it's the new bad weather, it's the new threat of starvation, it's the new disease, really. And just as our ancestors dealt with all those problems, we have to deal with this problem today. And there are a lot of people hard at work on finding solutions. 
You just have to be alert to it and and prepare. Yep. We got one more guy calling. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Who's this? Good morning. This is Claudio. Claudio, what's on your mind? Hey, uh, I want to ask you, guest, uh, if you heard about uh, the the pirate internet because the government, you know, the our politicians get bribed and and make laws to control the internet. And the people that are against that wear off because they're not paid. They don't have time to be fight them all the time. So I heard about this uh, this pirate internet. They use cell phone network, but not the the cell phone companies, but the, just the hardware to get that internet. What well, you know anything about that? And uh, what do you think about? It? I've I've I have friends of mine who have managed to acquire a cell phone and not use a contract at all, and still get uh, you know very high speed internet access and it involves uh, uh, you know what's it, what's, it, what's it called unlocking the cell phone and and downloading through your desktop uh, a lot of specialized programs and it's really not for the faint of heart uh, it's for you, know, it's pretty, you have to be pretty techy and pretty motivated to pull it off but I know it can be done and I have friends of mine who have done it it's not anything I've pursued but uh, I feel like you know having just recently conquered Bitcoin, <laughs> uh, you know, I feel like I've got my, I've got my, I, I, you know, I've sort of done the thing for now. So maybe I'll take on the uh, contract-free browsing, you know, question, you know, sometime next month. I don't know. I like tech stuff a lot, but, I, uh, but uh, you can only do so many things. Uh, by the way, you know, another way you ought to think about protecting yourself online is, I think it's it's about time that everybody kind of get interested in Bitcoin because this is an absolutely brilliant. Innovation is so much like the gold standard in many ways. It's better than the gold standard. And it could be the thing that really finally breaks that money went off of the government. Yeah, I got it. When you first started talking about it, I got an email from a friend right away saying, yes, <laughs> he's talking about Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it and, and a lot of people think that this is just you know, a far-flung topic just for crazy geeks and things like that. But it actually... Nowadays, the apps are becoming much more easy to use, and uh, you can shop and do so many things with them. Um, it's becoming a real viable vehicle. Uh, you know, we saw so many people in Cyprus you know, moving into to Bitcoin uh, and choosing it over gold just because it doesn't have the problems of, 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 the, of the gold standard of being controlled by the government, for one thing. It's a big problem with the gold standard, and the other, the other problem is... Uh, you know, the, the sheer weight required in that warehousing function. Bitcoin avoids all this stuff. It, you know, someday there should definitely be the Nobel Peace Prize to given to the anonymous uh, inventor of this uh, standing contraption. So keep an eye on that on that technology because uh, we could be seeing things unravel much more quickly than anybody has so far anticipated, and Bitcoin could be a major uh, catalyst event. Jeffrey, yeah. thanks for being here today. We're, uh, oh, we at the we're, we're at the end already. I, if folks would like to learn more about what you do with laissez-faire books, how do they uh, get in contact with you? How do they play follow Yeah, up? just go to laissez-faire books. Join our club. It's 10 bucks a month, and we give you unlimited downloads of all of our, our EPUBs. Every one of our EPUBs is carefully, carefully prepared. I write a long introduction. We have some cool new products like multimedia books that kind of bridge the, the gap between movies and books. Um, we're really on the cutting edge with all this stuff, and we distribute what I would consider to be the most brilliant, uh, best literature in the world of uh, freedom and libertarian ideas. We also and, have uh, a link to your website on ours, on Patriot Cement, and I, I suggest it. people get on Lou Rockwell to read your archives and just uh, YouTube Jeffrey Tucker. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank We've you. had some wonderful guests, and you are definitely <laughs> one of the best. I appreciate <laughs> Thanks your time. Thanks for coming on today. Okay. All right, uh, Josh. Oh, I, glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, contact information for Patriots Lament. PatriotsLament.blogspot.com or PatriotsLament at gmail.com for the email. And, and, the, and the big takeaway for today is get the, prepared and protect yourself. The market will prevail. Exactly. Baby. All right. Uh, coming up next, it's Health Talk. And, of course, more 
Live talk right here on KFAR Local Talk Radio online at KFAR660.com and on your smartphone with the free TuneIn Radio app. We will see you again next week right here on Patriots Lament on KFAR. <laughs>